Just because I'm fat, that doesn't invalidate the things that I say. She died. You ready to get supersized? She died too. Today I've got the big fruit loop. He's dead. Join me on my fat positive radio show. Which didn't last long because she died. My hair is getting stuck on the Christmas tree. She's falling apart. Welcome back to my channel. There are a lot of lies that modern progressivism tells, right? And unfortunately, because a large chunk of the population is stuck on stupid, they do believe them, no matter how obviously deceptive and insane the lies are, a lot of people believe them. I consider one of the most damaging lies that is told by the establishment is that you can be healthy at any size, that you can be obese and somehow happy. And that lie has spawned the absolutely hellish movement, fat positivity. And I am 100% glorifying obesity and there's nothing you can do about it. It's ironic, right? that it's called the fat positivity movement because they're not moving. Because TikTok has really taken the reins and has popularized it and taken it to this over the top level of exposure, we get to see these people documenting their journeys, their fat journeys. And what you're starting to see is these people are dying. Literally famous influencers within this movement are passing away very young. So the first person we're gonna look at who passed away is a very popular TikToker who goes by the handle of sick and tired of waiting. I ruined my life with food, um, binge eating, and lack of self-care. Um, and I'm hoping that it's not too late for me this time. Um, you know, I ain't been to the store in two years, maybe more now, I guess. Um, I went to the post office once and that was hard. I went to urgent care and I thought my legs were gonna give out from under me because um, I had to stand there the entire time after walking in. Can I ask what's positive about that? Especially given the context that you already have that she is now dead. This was her second to last TikTok. What's really sad about this girl is that not only did she pass away extremely young, as you can see, but also towards the end of her life, she seemed to have kind of come to her senses about fat positivity and she was actually trying to lose weight. I was truly okay with dying. I, I accepted it that it was just, this is just how it was gonna go. I was gonna eat myself until it just, it all went away one day. I realized I can't give up. I, I cannot, there is too much riding on me being able to do this and I have so many people that need me here. And uh, I cannot let the things that have happened be the reason why it's the end for me. But she had gotten to such a point where it was simply too late. So what's really sick about this story I saw is that Tess Holiday commented on this now dead girls TikTok. Tess Holiday is a fat model, an obese model, who is famous for spreading this message. No. There are a few words that I don't allow when somebody comes into my house and healthy is one of them. That's really all you need to know about her right there, right? She is promoting to her audience, one of which we can see is a young lady who died, saying that she doesn't even allow the word healthy in her home. Promotes this self-harm, literally. Start calling it that. It's called self-harm. Masked as self-love, which is sick. Oh my God, this means so much. I love you. Thank you so much. So. You loved someone who encouraged you to self-harm in this way, that led this cult, that brought you down this path. As if excluding the word healthy from your vernacular is somehow self-love or somehow loving yourself, that refusing to take care of yourself or give a fuck about what happens to your body is self-love. And y'all wanna look at every political influencer when there's a political tragedy in the world, right? and say, oh my God, it's this one's fault because we see they follow this influencer and we see this and we see that. And sometimes that's applicable. Sometimes there are crazy people in the world who tell people to do crazy things. But a lot of the times I see very benign, like standard political commentators getting hit with, you know, hate articles about how they led someone to committing some sort of atrocity. Meanwhile, Tess Holliday is up here speaking at the United Nations after a clear cut example here of leading a young girl into death. 
we have been affected in the plus size modeling industry and um, as she was sharing overall by um, deep issues that are rooted in racism. I mean, the fact that folks despise larger bodied individuals roots back to racism. It all roots back to racism. Tess Holliday, who sees herself as some sort of fat Rosa Parks, is, in my opinion, more like a fat Charles Manson, just a cult leader, literally led this girl to death. And you have to wonder why the establishment pushes this lie so hard, right? Imagine a population easier to control than a sick one. Look no further than the fact that they pushed that lie as hard as ever during COVID, during a pandemic for which something like 70 something percent of the people that were hospitalized during COVID were obese. And yet they were still pushing that lie. And yet Tess Holliday dared show her face in that climate. But little kids going to the park during COVID were killing grandmas. Okay, glad you all got your seven boosters. Maybe you should have not gotten the seven hamburgers. Like I just, oh wait, they were giving the hamburgers for free if you got the booster. Did you say free fries when you get vaccinated? If this is appealing to you, just think of this when you think of vaccination. Mmm. Vaccination. Mm. <laughs> I'm getting a very good feeling. Nothing keeps a population more oppressed than keeping them in a constant state of poor health. And if you can convince that population that that self-harm they're engaging in is actually self-love, just gaslight them right to their faces. No, you love yourself if you glutton yourself to the point where you're not mobile. Tess Holiday is inspirational. And the Victoria's Secret models actually set unrealistic expectations. Listen, this can be very subjective and y'all can disagree with me because you're free to be wrong. But in my opinion, it's a whole lot more unrealistic to become the size of a mountain than to become that size, right? Because I can't imagine the amount of, like I've been saying, self-harm it would take to even get to that state. I mean, a lot of them say it just crept up on them, but like, I don't know how much I believe that. It's gotta take years. So like being thin is unrealistic, but being Tess Holiday's size is realistic. A body size that has not even really existed until very recently in history. It's a bit supernatural. And of course you're gonna call me fat phobic. I have no irrational fear of people who are fat. Fat phobia isn't the irrational fear of fat people. It's the irrational fear of becoming fat because you know how society treats us and you're treating us that way. You can frame it as self-love and blah, 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 and all the other shit you're saying, but the science doesn't agree with you. The science says that what you are doing is harmful to fat people. So Dr. Kat Paz is another leading, well, was a leading voice in the fat positive movement. Hi. My name is Kat, and I'm usually the fattest person in the room. Join me on my fat positive radio show, Friend of Maryland, where we talk fat politics, scholarship, identity, culture, and activism with fat people from around the world. She was a Massey University fat studies professor. Fat studies. What the f are you studying? And y'all wanna say, that the colleges haven't fallen. Y'all wanna look at people crazy when they say colleges are just not quite what they used to be. Fat studies. Wow. The science isn't actually as clear cut as we like to believe. And there's not really quite a consensus yet about the real relationship between weight and health. Obese people and even morbidly obese people have just as good of health or sometimes even better health than people who are in the healthy weight ranges. I'm not trying to make light of these people's death. It's actually very sad. And as someone who has struggled with eating disorders throughout my life and someone who just knows about body image just a whole lot, right? Y'all see the before picture. It's been a lot. You know, it's, it, it's clear as day to see these people are not happy. And the lie that these people themselves will tell you is that they are happy, but 
Science has more and more shown that mental health is directly connected to gut health. That anxiety, depression, or stress you feel could be due to an imbalance of gut microbiota. There is so much about the gut that science is discovering. A study showed that patients with depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and autistic spectrum disorder have different gut microbiota compositions. Up to 50%. Of dopamine that your body synthesizes is synthesized within the gut dopamine is that little chemical that makes you happy makes you want to live life makes you feel pleasure keeps your mental health in check like you need dopamine you definitely do you can't do anything without without dopamine ask anyone who has adhd which is a dopamine deficiency disorder they can't do much. What specifically is it about poor gut health that causes more anxiety? It's inflammatory based. A lot of people will think of swelling. Inflammation can cause swelling, but really the inflammatory process involves the secretion or the production of lots of chemicals in the body that can have a negative effect on cells. With poor gut health, you can get chemicals that are secreted by some of these bacteria. They travel through the vagus nerve loosening nerve connections so for optimal brain functioning you need nerves to tightly connect to one another if you start getting loose connections between these nerves you start getting inadequate functioning that inadequate functioning can be responsible for both depression you can also get malfunctioning of certain structures in the brain that are responsible for controlling or modulating your anxiety so if you have a suspicion that the these fat activists, when they say they're so happy and it's all about self-love and they're, you know, fat liberation, they say they feel liberated, they feel free, they're happy, they love themselves. If you have a sneaking suspicion that that's all bullshit, you're correct. My boyfriend's new apartment hates fat people. This is the kitchen. This is the fridge. Oh, let's go. Oh, oh it opens from the other side. Oh, can't fit here. Oh, every time you want to go to the fridge. So I guess what we could do is we can just like open it the other way, right? And then sneak it while it's open. Here we go. Oh! Waffler69 is another example of a TikToker that died extremely young. He died at 33, my God. TikTok star Waffler69 has died at the age of 33. The famed foodie, whose real name is Taylor, died on Wednesday night. His brother Clayton announced the sad news in a TikTok video. He has passed away from a presumed heart attack. Clayton told TMZ that Taylor was experiencing discomfort, and when things got worse, he called an ambulance to take him to a hospital, where the Louisiana native died that night. I'm 30, I can't imagine having three years left in my life because I'm making eating videos on TikTok. What's really sad also about him is if you look back at his videos, his first videos, which never hit, that the algorithm never picked him up, he never got famous for them, were regular videos. They weren't him eating. And then as soon as he started eating crazy shit on camera, his shit went up. So it's like he got stuck in this weird dystopian, psychotic 21st century problem of like, I'm getting paid to eat unhealthy foods and like gross people out on camera and it's killing my body, but it's making me money. It's very, it's very dark. It's very dystopian. Like I said, he wasn't necessarily on camera talking about fat is beautiful. You can be healthy, but he was taken by clearly the idea that he can just live on and eat like that, which is a lie directly told by the fat positive movement. You can't eat like that and live forever. You just can't. He died of a heart attack. It's all heart attacks, right? Jamie Lopez is another example of a young woman died at 37. And this one is really sad. She seemed like a really lovely, you know, woman full of life. And what's really sad is she's another example of someone who towards the end of her life decided that she wasn't actually feeling positive. She wasn't actually happy being that obese and she was trying to lose weight. And I knew I had so much more purpose and so much more life to live. I've been working on myself to become mobile again. I completely changed my eating habits. This is keto pizza, I just took it out of the oven. I lost 400 pounds and I've been learning how to walk again. But sometimes you get yourself to a certain point and you're, it's just over, it's a wrap. She also passed away. She had a TV show centered around her and all the other employees being morbidly obese. You ready to get supersized? Baby.BDK Tour is the first ever salon by plus size girls for plus size girls. Can't nobody tell them they not fly at 700 pounds. You better go big or go home. The all new series. The whole 
and, you know, gag of it was like, we're big and we're beautiful and we're salon workers and we can do what you can do. And you can't do what we can do because your legs are going to give out. Your heart's going to give out. It's just, these are just simple facts. And why y'all get so upset about simple inoffensive truths beyond me, beyond me. As a result of these people dying, people are leaving the movement, as you can see. The positivity movement kept me fat and complacent. Obviously my decisions were up to me and I'm not going to sit here and say the community put a gun to my head and told me I was going to be fat forever um, because I take responsibility for my actions. But reading the shit in the body positivity movement and interacting with the people in the community at the time enabled me to not make good decisions for my health. I'm just being honest based on my experience. I know other people have had better experiences with it and I love that. But again, that's just not my experience. I personally didn't think that there was anything positive about me and my body when I was not taking care of myself. And I was obese at one point and people will still say you weren't obese. You were midsize if that I was obese and people just don't understand what that is anymore because everybody is overweight. I actually feel kind of guilty for being a part of this movement. I see a lot of fat girls who gain a lot of weight from being caught up in this movement and turning around five, six, seven years later talking about, damn, I let my health go to sh I got this problem now. I'm 400 pounds. I can't do this. I can't do that. I'm not claiming that you got to hate fat people. That's literally the opposite of what I'm saying. But let's be for real. Health is real. Organs failing is real. Diabetes, heart disease, all that is real okay it's not fat phobic to care about your health and as you can imagine of course those ladies are getting massive amounts of hate because they dare to not want to die it really sucks that all of these people who showed me what body positivity was who taught me about the movement who were saying things like like fat bodies deserve respect to care and that weight loss doesn't always work and yada yada are then turning to it later on and no longer uplifting or having the same messages. God forbid they observe what's happening to others within the community dropping dead suddenly. Oh, suddenly. Y'all know, I often say that when an idea just doesn't make any sense and it flies in the face of logic just so hard, but people are so hell bent on believing it, Half the time when it makes no sense, it's because it's like a sex thing. I believe this. The furry thing doesn't make sense. So for me, it's like, that's a sex thing. A lot of these trannies coming up, I look at that and I'm like, oh, that's a sex thing. That's not the same. No. A lot of the times it's true. We, we are beings that, you know, sex is like our fuel and it's wild, but it is. So if you ever had a sneaking suspicion that the fat positive movement is just a sex thing, um, there's some validity to that if you look at the history of it, which is actually very dark and scary. Enter NAFA, the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance. R for revolution, e for everybody. They're mad as hell and they're not gonna diet anymore. S to say, T, tear it down. I look a lot like my fat mother who's 80 years old and she mows the lawn and I think I'm lucky to get this body. You are sexy and <laughs> And what they really mean is to advance the fat fetish because the leader, Bill Fabry, started this movement because his fat wife was getting ridiculed and he became ashamed of being with her. So he created an organization that on its face was trying to get people to accept fat women specifically. It's always the women, right? Notice how there's no men in this movement other than perverts who are into fat women. Basically, this group descended into an entire group that on paper looks as though it's, you know, for society's benefit, apparently, but it's actually just like a fetish meetup group. During the 70s, NAFA also started adding personal dating ads in their newsletter of what was usually a fat woman looking for a partner or a fat admirer looking for a fat woman. NAFA also held annual conventions where members show up to party, attend events, and socialize. These events were, according to members and non-members alike, a giant meat fest full of lots of lustful behavior. And the videos, <laughs> the videos. Enough with the diet talk already. Welcomed as a hero in Newark, lawyer and author Professor Paul Campos, whose controversial book, The Obesity Myth, has just hit the shelves. And that it doesn't make any sense to focus on our weight, and it especially doesn't make any sense to focus on making fat people thin, which is an absolutely crazy kind of public health policy. And everybody claps. 
you can see this is literally just some weird pervert trying to appease a room full of women that he has a hard on for. It's literally just clear as day. If you watch that video on mute, you could see that. He claims the obsession with weight is more about idolizing thinness than health. All of the hysteria that we're hearing right now about how we're undergoing some huge public health crisis because of increasing weight is just that. It's hysteria, it's moral panic, it's not based on some sort of legitimate health crisis of which there is none in the United States. They created magazines with fat women on the covers that were not x-rated but pretty damn close. They would have all these meetups and these events for which people would go to them and people would often walk away with very sour experiences because these women would go into the events thinking that it was about, you know, positivity and about, you know, accepting yourself and advancing society for fat people. And what they would find is it was a room full of fat women and a bunch of perverted dudes who weren't even fat, who wanted to have sex with them. And it was basically just like a big free for all. And it was a highly sexual event. So that's the history of literally where the fat positive movement started out of like a sex fetish group. And here's where y'all are going to say, Blair, you're kink shaming. I am. I am. What are you going to do about it? Uh, if your kink is like, you know, forcing someone or encouraging someone to eat themselves to death, you got to be checked. You're a sick and now you have a bunch of women, young, confused women on TikTok that have fallen into this group that was started to fetishize their body. And they think it's about self-love. They have been convinced. They have been neurologically rewired. Welcome to a day in the life of a fat activist. I start the day off feeding my cat some treats because she needs to know that unless she's fat, I won't love her. Then I took a bath because I'm far too lazy to stand and need to preserve all the calories that I can for the day. Then I filmed some TikToks, making sure to glorify obesity and show everyone how cool and trendy it is to be fat. They have been bamboozled into thinking that themselves is loving themselves. And that's again about the most dystopian thing I could imagine. I'm gonna be really honest, there's a lot of really fat phobic people out there, even in the queer community. I was a go-go dancer at a pride party and the amount of money that I made versus the amount of money that the thin people made was not the same. Sometimes people don't even feel comfortable like putting the money in my underwear, but people are like really awkward with like, should I touch you, should I? And I see them fully touching other people. So those are little reminders that people still have a lot of work to do around their fat phobia. I know that you feel like all the psychobabble that you're injecting into your little rant here mask the fact that you are so clearly just complaining about people not finding you hot, but you know, that's actually what you're saying here. I, was, I like how she said that the money she makes compared to the skinny go-go dancers, it's not the same. So, so now there's a fat wage gap, a fat gap. Okay. Human beings are hardwired to be attracted to health. This is just a simple fact. It's why people are attracted to nice skin, to, you know, certain body shapes that are healthier and they're more capable of giving birth. Like, this is just how people are hardwired. And just like so many other regressive social movements that are literally just trying to erode basic truths, basic inoffensive truths, like I said, when your goal is to undo evolution, you're not going to be successful, but it also creates a never ending problem, right? So you can always run your mouth because the problem can, can't be fixed. You set up a problem that can't be fixed and you're going to be fighting it for eternity, but a shortened eternity because you're not going to live as long. The sky is blue. I didn't make it so. Fat people are less likely to get the jobs and promotions they are qualified for, and they make less money than their thin counterparts across the board for doing the exact same work. Fat people are denied health insurance and medical care. So I would assume that a job wouldn't want to offer you medical care because you're going to need an exorbitant amount of it compared to even relatively healthy co-working counterparts of yours, right? So do they necessarily want to be on the line? to pay your life insurance, your health insurance, et cetera, when you're on your way out. It's the same reason they don't hire very elderly people. And you know, that can be perceived as effed up or it can be perceived as that's kind of the way of the world. And that's just kind of nature. You don't necessarily invest in someone 
who is on their way out. And as far as you not getting hired as much, I mean, again, you can complain that it's unfair or you can acknowledge the fact that in a lot of jobs, your ability to perform the job is going to be contingent on you being able to move at least a little bit, even if it's a retail job. You got to be on your feet. If it's a salon job, you got to be on your feet. There is a $72 billion industry in this mm -hmm. country that focuses on keeping people unhappy with their weight and yeah. you know, selling them products to lose weight. And personally, I often function out of spite. So the idea <laughs> that some white man somewhere is making money off of me hating myself, yeah. there's no way in hell. You're functioning out of spite for your own self, babe. A massive several billion dollar industry dedicated to helping people lose weight. It should be bigger, clearly. We should invest more in that. In fact, if our taxes are going to go to some I would rather it go to that than many of the other things that it goes to. I would. We need to lose weight. The country is too fat. So however many billion dollars of an industry for weight loss needs to be bigger so y'all can be smaller. They just love throwing out white man. You invoke a white man as the source of your problems and the conversation just over. And everyone just kind of chuckles like, oh, I know, right? But there's never any like follow up of like, really, is it a white man? Because I'm pretty sure Jenny Craig is a woman, right? That's her name is Jenny Craig. I don't know. The only people I see even hawking weight loss shit are women. Hi, Oprah. Reminder, you're allowed to take up space. Yeah, we see that. If you're a fat person who is not trying to lose weight, I love you. Keep it up. I know it's hard and people suck, but I love you. You see how these basic videos, literally, it's not enough for them to self-harm themselves. It's not enough for them to kill themselves. It's like they want to take as many people down as they can with this crab in a bucket ass mentality. So I think I just figured it out. The brain of a fat activist works very similar to that of a dog. You know how your dog really only reacts or responds to your tone of voice, not your words, because they don't understand words. So you can say anything to a dog in a nice tone and they'll react positively. What he's saying is, if you're actively killing yourself, I love you, which, you know, sounds very blatantly psychotic and barbaric, but because he's saying it in that nice tone of voice, that emotionally pleasing voice that liberals in general tend to love, right? You could tell them, election season, burn your own cities, but if you say it nice enough, they'll just do it and they won't see it as something crazy. It is not, uh, it is not generally speaking, unruly, but fires have been started. But it has been entirely peaceful, sometimes angry, but entirely peaceful. Right. So he's saying, you know, if you're f***ing yourself, I love you and they hear genuinely that he loves them. Fat the people are allowed to eat what they want oh, without feeling guilty about it. Sure. Get Make over it. Dribble, dribble. You know, right it so because you're allowed to means you should? Might there be any correlation between the oxygen you have hooked up to your nose and what you're eating? Is there any connection? A lot of people assume that I have oxygen because of my weight or something like that. Um, the reason I actually wear oxygen is because I have a rare lung disease. It is called pulmonary hypertension, not to be mistaken with high blood pressure. It is an actual lung disease. Fat phobia should make you uncomfortable because it is intertwined with every single other system of oppression that exists. It is related to sexism, racism, homophobia, xenophobia. Classism. And so when you talk about one, you talk about it all. Wow. I mean, that just goes to show you right there, especially now that we know the history of this movement that is literally born out of really demented fetish stuff and men taking advantage of them. It's even more dark that all these young, unhappy women are being caught up in it. And I know it's easy to laugh at these people because they are goofy as hell goof troops right but if you look at it for what it really is it's people in a very very dark place and i genuinely do feel bad for them the fact that your gut health and your mental health are so deeply connected 
that half of your dopamine comes from your gut, right? It makes all the sense in the world to me that you look at them and they're so damn unhappy. I mean, I know just for me as an example, it's like, if I'm bloated, if my stomach's upset, I'm not going anywhere. You can invite me out. You can promise an amazing time. I'm bloated, babe. Not going. And it's not just an aesthetic thing. It's not just that I look like bigger or whatever. It's literally that it has my mind effed up. I'm like, I don't feel good. I don't feel, no. So that makes all the sense in the world to me. With that being said, I love you guys. Make sure you follow me on X and Instagram. Make sure you subscribe to this channel as well as my podcast channel. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye, guys.